Welcome to our Made in Hackney Global Plant Kitchens webinar on growing a team for your vegan community kitchen or cookery school. I'm Sarita Puri. I'm a member of the Made in Hackney team working on the Global Plant Kitchens project. I'm also um, a teacher for Made in Hackney and worked on various pieces from everything from being a volunteer to running classes and to chefing in our community meal service. Really excited to be joined today by Ninka Brett, who is the former operations manager at Made in Hackney, who was part of the team for uh, nine years. And I'll let her start by telling her a bit about her journey over that period. Thank you very much, Sarita. And hello to the participants who've joined us today. So I've been asked to contribute to this session because I was one of the original staff members when Made in Hackney first started out back in 2012. I joined the organisation as a volunteer myself and my roles developed over time uh, into various different functions. So I became a project coordinator and then eventually director, co-director, and then I focused solely on the operations and the um, infrastructure of making Made in Hackney a, a really solid organization. So my background just briefly was I'd already worked in the nonprofit charity world for social enterprises. So I had a, a track record in um, building programs and communication processes in projects and charities. So I brought that with me to my role as a volunteer. Um, so we're going to start by just talking about how how a team can support you and why would you work with a team as opposed to on yourself. So people listening to this will be at different stages of their idea. Maybe some of you have just got the idea in your head or you've just started to talk about it with people around you, friends. But essentially, if you are the one who came up with the idea, you are, it, it can be, um, it can be a lonely place to set up an organization or a project. So having a team around you with skills to contribute will make it a stronger organization. It will increase the chances of being successful. It gives you a network of people you can share ideas with. Sometimes you may come up with challenges or obstacles and you can turn to people in your team to sort of share that responsibility um, and also celebrate the successes. So after you've been running for a while, you'll start to have um, achievements and it's nice to be able to celebrate that with people in your team. So essentially it's, it's, it's this getting in people with the skills that you don't have and sharing um, a sense of collaborative working. So for example, Made in Hackney, the founder was a journalist. So she had really good writing skills, public speaking. She was a wordsmith, really good with words, passionate about communicating the message of, of the organization. I had skills around setting up systems. So getting together processes, data capture, monitoring, um, writing, organizational policies, all the sort of the, the infrastructure that organizations sit on in order to grow. And then we had a finance person who obviously had the numbers expertise, which neither of us, Sarah the founder or I, that, that wasn't our confident place. So we needed someone who was competent in finances um, to be part of the founding team. So yes, so skills and, and collaborative working is probably the strongest compelling reason why a team is important. So how did we find the first few people? Um, so with a, a grant from the big lottery, which is one of the largest funders in the UK, they, there was um, money to set up three jobs. So the, the Sarah was the founder. She wrote the funding bid that got the money for Made in Hackney. So she was the first member of staff. 
uh, she was a pro project coordinator. So she needed to recruit two more people. She did this by um, advertising in the local area. So in Hackney, in London, putting a job ad out, looking for people with essentially a finance, so project management and finance skills. And as she needed another project coordinator to work with her to deliver the cookery programs. So essentially the skills again are some experience in having worked for a project program organization, good communication skills, ideally a passion and awareness of healthy plant-based eating. We were not looking for vegans. That was not an essential requirement. We were just looking for people who are passionate about and understanding the benefits of adopting a healthy plant-based lifestyle. Um, also people who were not afraid to work, um, maybe not always nine to five, in fact, hardly ever nine to five. So people who were flexible, maybe sometimes if we needed an extra few hours on a Friday or a Saturday, that would that was a benefit and also an understanding and connection with people that you're trying to support in your area so an, an understanding of what the need is why your project is needed in your area the first three positions um, in Maiden Hackney were the two project coordinators to manage the programs to keep the money coming in so even though we started with a, a significant grant from the lottery, that didn't mean we could just sit back and, you know, beat up, okay, no problem. We still need to continually look for more funding from foundations and trusts. And also someone we needed to manage the volunteer program and, um, and all, the, all the tasks related to that and various other project management roles, uh, tasks. And then the finance, which I've mentioned, someone trained in as an accountant or as a financial manager to be on top of all the, the, the money side of it. So those were the permanent members of staff. And then we had the freelancers. So these are people who you don't use every day, they're ad hoc. So in our case, it was the cookery teachers, so we would hire them just, for example, maybe to do two classes a month or one class a week. And they had a different type of role. We still, you still make them feel part of the organization and the culture and the team, but they are less, there are less hours required from their roles. So we started off, as you can see, um, two and then three staff in 2013. We recruited the first members of staff through posting job ads. Some, um, so Sarah obviously was automatically had the, the first job. She then advertised to get the second two positions. And we used all sorts of channels for advertising, uh, not just one, so you can choose there are various uh, charity job websites. There are social media partner organizations in your area who do similar work or who are supportive of the work you do. They can help publicize. You can go through, you can do flyering, you can put a poster up in community centers. So you, you, you reach out to as many um, outlets as you feel would generate some response and some interest. Um, there's never too, too many sources. So by 2019, we had seven staff. So that included, we had an enterprise manager by then to look at new business development areas. We had a fundraising manager, someone exclusively um, focusing on fundraising. We had a venue manager who looked after the kitchen, all the stocks, ordering, cleaning, because up till that point, me and Sarah had been doing that ourselves. Um, and we had a, um, we also had program managers for externally funded programs like Hackney Public Health came with a staff position. Um, 
So that's how we, we grew. And then in the last couple of years, it's been very much connected to the COVID, the community for meal service. We suddenly designed a whole new program of uh, cooking meals at scale and delivering them to people living in the community. Volunteers are an amazing, fantastic way to bring in skills and expertise to support you and in delivering your work and to add value and allow you to increase your scale and your impact. Maiden Natalie would never have achieved the success it has without its large volunteer base. Um, as I've mentioned, skills. So people who come in, bring in skills that are, you may not have or that are needed to, to bring scale up the work of your projects, extra capacity, um, and also a sense of community spirit. So that, you know, the more people you have working or with you supporting your work, it's, it creates a nice collaborative team spirit. And you start feeling like um, you're, you, you have a, a, a good, um, diverse group of people to help you achieve your aims and objectives. Um, now, it's very important that the people offering their time receive something they feel is valuable to them. So supporting your volunteers is as important, making them feel valued, giving them opportunities to um, really develop their own uh, skills and uh, knowledge of this sector. Um, and by doing that, to motivate them, you, you, you offer them training, you offer them work experience, um, which is skills related. They may be going through a career change or they may be a student, a young person needing employability skills. They may want to be interested in setting up their own projects relating to food or become a chef. Or So you're giving them a chance to develop um, their own uh, professional skills and experience of working for a, a non-profit social enterprise. So recruiting volunteers. Now, there are many ways you can go about doing this, but the first thing to consider is make, identify the roles in your project that you don't have time to do, but that are not considered roles that are essential. What I mean by that is, um, volunteers shouldn't be taking the place of paid staff. They should be adding value to core programs, um, but there should be a, a, a clear di distinction between a paid staff member's job description and a volunteer. So make the role sound attractive, make it appealing, Use language where you get excited when you read it. So emphasize what they can learn, the delicious food they're going to eat, the, the skills they're going to learn, the people they're going to meet, um, the opportunities it could lead to after volunteering. So really make an appealing role that someone reading it could not refuse. That's, that's one really uh, important thing. And enjoyment. They've got to be fun. These, these positions, opportunities, at the end of the day, there needs to be a sense of fun, enjoyment, laughter, learning, friendships. Write down the role, um, the core tasks, the duties that are required, and create that into a role description. Then you decide how you want to people to apply. So in the beginning, Made in Hackney did not have an application form. We just, people would ring up or send an email to our info address and say, oh, I made that me looks great. How can I get involved? Um, and they would just literally write an email. Um, some people didn't even have a CV. So we were much more flexible. Well, we were more um, open in the very, uh, in year one to receiving expressions of interest from people. It was only in, as the years went on, year two, three, four, when, the scale of our work started really um, increasing that we had more people wanting to get involved because the more well-known you become, the more interest you're going to, to, to gather. So then we had an application form. 
and we put this online and we made it automated so that people filled in the form and then we got it, it, it entered into an online database and we could see all the information about um, their skills, their motivation, um, all, all the necessary information we needed. So that was more only after several years, not in the beginning. Um, and also the skills of the people you're looking for, some of your roles will be generalist, which means um, they don't need to have qualifications, they just need reliability, punctuality, enthusiasm. Uh, some roles will be much more focused on, well, we'd really like you to have experience working in a kitchen, ideally with a food hygiene certificate. So you will define your roles according to what you need. Um, and this will change over time as your programs develop. Um, and of course, make sure you have insurance when you're working with volunteers as well. And ideally a budget. So we, we had a budget for expenses. So we used to, um, volunteers can claim a daily allowance for volunteering. So a specific amount of money for perhaps a meal, if, if they work over the lunch hour or eat or late, then they can claim for a meal and also for um, travel. Okay, so now you've got a few people, you've got them signed up and you're thinking, okay, we wanna make sure they're happy, they're looked after, they don't leave, that they, they're gonna keep coming back. So to make sure this happens, you have to look after them, treat them like family. Um, so give them a proper induction, a welcome into your organization. So what are the most important things they need to know about supporting, working with you? Um, who do they need to meet? What's the health and safety requirements of being in the kitchen? Um, what's, uh, sign, ask them to sign a volunteer agreement, ideally, um, and offer them some training. So if they're going to be in the kitchen a lot, then obviously food safety, food hygiene training is really important. We offer training in safeguarding because they are in Made in Hackney. A lot of our volunteers work with people from at risk backgrounds. Um, and so it's very important that they understand the risks involved of that working with very different groups of people. So we offered them training in safeguarding in child protection, first aid. Uh, and this was a benefit of, of being a volunteer at Maiden Hackney. Um, having someone to manage volunteers, that's really important. One point of contact. So identify who is gonna be the person to uh, give them direction, advice, if they need feedback, if they have problems, questions. One person is, needs to be that one, that contact with them. And probably I would say one of the most important things is, is how you communicate. So allow for flexibility with communication. Some people don't respond to WhatsApp very well. They only, they only respond to emails. Some people love WhatsApp. Some people need to be physically phoned. Uh, some people may be hard of hearing, so you can't phone them. They'll, you have, they only can use email. Um, so some people, some of our volunteers are, work, are partially sighted. Um, so you have to think of all the different barriers to communication that some people may have and respond and accommodate that because you want your volunteers to represent your community and the people you support. So you want to be able to make it as, as accessible as possible. Um, I, for example, had all my volunteer names because I, I was the volunteer manager for many years and I had all my volunteers on my phone, all their numbers on my phone. And I would just WhatsApp them regularly um, so that I could get very quick responses and group, group broadcast messages when you have new opportunities. And it's also good if you have a cancellation. So, you know, in the morning of a class, you may get someone saying, oh, sorry, I can't. I can't attend. And then you have to scramble around looking for a replacement. 
Um, okay, thanking volunteers also very important. Um, you can meet, you know, have picnic together, you can have coffee, uh, like coffee and cake sessions or whatever you like to, to create as a thank you gesture for your volunteers will again help them feel motivated to stay and create, we call our volunteer family exactly that, a family. They're part of the Maiden Happy. But that is a really good opportunity um, to just ask a couple of follow-up questions that we've received. You talked a bit about volunteers and you made the really, really good point that we do not need um, people to be vegans to get involved in a vegan community cookery school. Have you got any advice similar to that, but where there might be an area where there's there just seems to be less of a perceived interest in the work that you're doing? Um, how do you get either staff or volunteers um, on board with that? So I would suggest that you set up a, um, a, a cookery class, or arrange a dedicated class, which is made up of friends, family, people who have been with you from the beginning, and make it a test class um, and make it a really fun, um, uh, you know, visually beautiful recipes and, and take photos and film it and use that as your case study. Because what you don't have in the beginning is content. You don't have examples. So you need to create those examples yourself. So in the very beginning, I think Made in Hackney, we, we, we staged a cookery class. Um, and we just invited friends to say, right, what, can you sample what we're going to be offering to the community and then ask for their feedback? So just say, will you please provide feedback? Um, and then we use their testimonials to then use to promote and encourage other groups to join. So where it doesn't exist, you just have to create it. The next question we've had is around trustees. So as a charity in the UK, Maiden Hackney has a board of trustees. So if you could just tell us a bit more um, about that in terms of how we've recruited and sort of the important things to look for when you're establishing a board of trustees. We were ambitious. We didn't just want two or three. We went for 12, which you don't need that many, but we just wanted people because the, the, the thing about a Board of Trustees is, again, it's another opportunity to bring in professional skills into your organisation. So I, I basically said, let's just put it out there, advertise, um, because you can invite friends and people, but it's also good to get people who don't know you. They're impartial. They don't come with preconceived ideas. You're getting fresh um, views from people in working in different sectors. So we put an ad out through specifically trustee search websites. And again, I think there was an organization called Get On Board, which helps charities find trustees. And we had an incredible response. We were really surprised. Well, I, I wasn't too surprised, but some people were surprised because you never think that people are gonna come and be interested in, in, in what you're offering in the beginning. So we were like, um, we, we attracted, I think, 40 or 50 applica applications from people, lawyers, filmmakers, teachers, business owners, um, from all different walks of life. And we did an extensive interviewing process and we managed to whittle it down to 12. <laughs> and the ones who we wanted to keep, but couldn't because there weren't enough spaces, we kept in touch with them so that at a later date, we could use their skills in other ways. So always keep in touch with people who get, who, who are interested in your work because you never know when you might be able to reach out to them again in the future. Every person who writes to you, it could potentially be helpful for you. Um, and then managing them. So once you've got them, again, really important to have someone in your organization to look after your board, make them feel valued, set up governance. You need to have a trustee governing document, which sets out the responsibilities of a trustee. So you, there is a bit of um, paperwork that you need to get um, sorted. Um, but um, once that's done, 
you do it's just a case of meeting four times a year and you and the chair the chair of trustees it's their responsibility to actually rally the trustees together to do have those meetings in in coordination with the, the member of staff who is the trustee contact great thank you that was superb advice um, we've had a question come in about volunteering and recruitment. So this is from an established community kitchen um, down in Exeter. They get lots of volunteer inquiries, but some people never reply when they um, are asked to fill in the application form. Some fill in the application form, but then don't reply to an email for an offer to meet up. Um, and then even when um, trying to message them after, they still don't reply. So how do you overcome that? that challenge of, you know, people are, they, they express an interest, but then um, they sort of don't follow up. And how can you, I suppose, essentially try and reach more people? That's a really good question. So I was pretty shameless when I was getting the first group of volunteers. So I would ring, if emails doesn't work, ring. So some people just don't manage their email inbox especially if they're corporates they're working in companies or they're working in, in organizations where they get 100 emails a day um try and ring physically ring i know we don't do that very much anymore um it's like writing a letter we don't write letters but make a phone call or send a whatsapp say just with one line going great to hear from you when can we chat um, and give a time so make it as easy as possible for them to reply. Um, similarly, emails, don't give up. Um, I used to have keep a list of people who'd written in that I couldn't get reach. And I'd contact them a week later. I'd, I'd re-email them. So I wouldn't kind of let that just slide. I'd, I'd persevere. Um, and sometimes they pop up and go, oh, I'm really sorry. Um, something came up. I suddenly wasn't available. I didn't want to let you down, but now I am available. So people's situations change all the time. Um, so don't give up. Keep keep thinking of new ways of advertising. Where else have you not tried? Um, but don't give up on the ones who write to you and don't you don't hear from them again because they 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 may pop up again. Thank you. Um, and I think that point about people's situation changing is super important. So yeah, do hopefully persevere with that and hopefully we'll get the message out. Um, the next question is going to lead us into that final slide that we have. Um, we were just wondering a bit more about sort of a lot of the admin behind this. Um, you've talked about the recruitment processes and how to volunteer, but in terms of being able to sort of successfully manage a growing team, be it paid for staff, um, and volunteers, um, there is some admin that is required. So um, I will just bring up that last slide and let you talk through that. In the very beginning, um, the very basic infrastructure that you need, that you'll all be familiar with, is how do you collect data? How do you, um, where do you save shared documents? So we had a pretty standard system we had Dropbox, which is a cloud-based content management where you save your documents. Um, we used Google. We had all our email addresses of, of mine, Sarah, the core team all use Gmail and Google Drive, which has a facility for saving documents. Um, we had a website which was managed by a volunteer. He, he, he actually designed a bespoke web infrastructure. Um, so again, a good role to give a volunteer if you trust them and they don't run off with. <laughs> and then it was only much later that we got a cloud based CRM, which is stands for Customer Relationship Management System. Salesforce is a very sophisticated data management system for doing everything, volunteer management, evaluation, fundraising. Um, the company is based in America. They give 10 free licenses to charities. So that's the, br the brilliant thing about Salesforce is that you actually get the software. You don't have to pay. Um, but if you need to customize it, then that's you do need to have a bit of investment in that. But we didn't get Salesforce until year seven or eight. Um, so you can perfectly manage running your project on free, the free systems that exist, like 
the ones I've mentioned. HR, so this is obviously very important legally if you're employing staff, then you do need to have employment contracts. And if you're working with volunteers, you need a volunteer agreements. So we didn't have HR expertise in the organization. So I that responsibility came to me. So if I didn't have that, so I looked for it. I There are organizations that provide pro bono free HR advice. Um, and in fact, there are many organizations that support the nonprofit charity, social enterprise sector, skilled companies that will give you their time for free. So this is a really valuable thing to, to be aware of. So I had an HR mentor. She was a, an HR consultant and she used to mentor me to develop the documents that we needed for um, staff and volunteers. Um, website I've mentioned, that was with a volunteer. In the beginning, actually, this is an interesting bit of uh, insight. In the very beginning, our volunteers did all our social media. So we had what we call volunteer apprentices, and they, with our guidance, um, they used to do our social media posting every day. But we changed that because we weren't getting a consistent look, feel, um, brand. And we needed, as we grew as an organization, we needed to become more slick and more professional and actually more consistent with how we were using language and, and imaging. So we hired someone to be, and they were dedicated to our social media presence. And of course, your governance. So you need you need all the organizational policies to make sure you're operating um, and you're complying with charity charity commission uh, guidelines. So you need policies around health and safety, safeguarding, data protection. If you're collecting uh, contact details and personal information from the general public, you need to be very careful with how you store that information. So you need a data protection policy and you need all the governing documents to have a board of trustees. So there's many policies um, that you need to consider as you grow in size. Thank you. And on globalplantkitchens.org, um, you can find a lot of templates for the policies that Ninka mentioned in the toolkit. And if you go through the organisational setup module, as well as the growing a team module, there'll be signposting to a lot of um, what Ninka has mentioned. But if there's anything else anyone wants to know, they can uh, drop us an email. I've got another question here. Freelance teachers who are a massive part of the Maiden Hackney team. And what is the best way or some advice on sort of training them and supporting them so that they can really um, provide a sort of cohesive message and way of um, presenting the Maiden Hackney sort of ethos and, and way of uh, teaching? Yeah, that's a good question. So as they do receive training, we have a teacher's pack, which we developed. It has um, a whole section on nutrition, the nutritional benefits of different types of plant food. It has um, working with groups, the challenges, what can happen, what can go wrong, um, frequently asked questions from people in a typical class, safeguarding issues. And this is really important for teachers to feel confident to um, come in and work with um, a group that they will meet through Made in Hackney. Um, so it's really important that we support them through that process. Um, yeah, to avoid that. Great, thank you. Um, and we have another question, which is um, in a similar vein. So how do you manage the uncertainty of funding with the need for a stable team? Oh, gosh, very good question. Very good question. Hope, faith, um, a belief, an outlook on life that the glass is half full. <laughs> but faith that people believe in what you're doing. The more track record you build up in your first year, the more people you can get to talk about you and feedback and say, what a wonderful project, this benefited me. The more examples of the benefits you're, you're providing, 
that will help you um, get the credibility um, and to get more support. And funders will recognize and see that you're, they want to, to fund you. Um, but I don't have the, the golden answer for that one, I'm afraid. Uh, yeah, you just have to have faith. Great, thank you. And um, we've had another question in here. So it's a bit around um, training and support, I suppose. So if your volunteers and cookery teachers are not vegan, um, how do you ensure that they don't promote non-vegan options? For example, using honey in a dish or saying you could also use cheese here. We check all recipes before a class uh, takes place. The teacher sends us the recipes. We look through them. We check the ingredients list. We also check for things like maybe excessive use of salt or a type of oil. Um, and we talk with the teacher about why we would like them to substitute certain ingredients. If honey slips in there, we give them alternatives, um, non, uh, you know, vegan alternatives. And we just remind them that one, whilst they're working for Maiden Hackney, they do need to represent our values and ethics and food policy. Um, we also have each cookery class has two assistants who are volunteer, we, we call them hosts. And they also are there to support the teacher and, and talk it, during the class about um, plant-based alternatives to typical foods like cheese, um, dairy, cream, eggs. What are plant-based alternatives to these ingredients? So it's just, you know, making sure you brief the teachers and checking their recipes in advance. And if you have a teacher who say something in their class, like uh, we've made this gorgeous salad, you could put some chicken on it or have this with some brie. Um, is there a way of sort of managing that or monitoring that? I, think, I mean, I think you can't, I mean, it's the, in reality, if the, if the class is made up of people who, I mean, we, we did, we, we've done classes with male groups from men in sheds and, you know, real meat eaters and, um, young teenagers who go out and get chicken and chips as soon as they finish the class. I mean, we're not, you know, we're not ignorant. We do realize that as soon as they leave the kitchen, they can't, they're not going to become 100% plant based. So I think that's just a judgment call. You could say, you can encourage the teacher to say, you can have this salad with, have it with your, a meal of your choice, but have the salad with it. That will be the healthy. Um, accompaniment to what you eat or maybe reduce we talk about reducing your meat consumption so try having if they're regular meat eaters you'd say try having meat free Mondays or try one or two days a week or if that's too much one two meals a day um, so you you just use your judgment and you you kind of have that conversation of what is realistic to the group you're working with but you don't preach because then you'll just they won't listen, you'll alienate. You meet them on their level and their language. Absolutely. And I think that is definitely a message that Maiden Hackney always prescribes to about meeting people where they are. Um, because slow steps is how change happens. Um, so we are coming to the end of our hour together. That has whizzed by. Um, I would just like to thank you, Ninka, so much for um, everything you've shared today and your input into this course overall. Um, is there any final words of wisdom you want to share um, to anyone watching? Um, don't give up. Um, have, yeah, just make sure you are having fun because there will be times when you, you, you do work long hours and you, you forget the purpose, but just keep your spirits up and remember that ultimately it should be, you should enjoy what you're doing um, and listen, listen to your feedback. That is the most motivational thing is listening to people who've enjoyed your, your, your events, your classes, and that's the motivation that you, as, as the founder, needs to keep going. And it will pay off, it will pay off, I promise. Absolutely, what great advice to end on. If you're not already registered for globalplankkitchens.org, please do so because there is so much valuable information and resources in there, and you can also get in touch with us directly. 
um, through the email as well if you have any questions that you don't think are covered. But yeah, thanks again to Ninka and thanks again for everyone who's watched this in one format or another. And we hope to welcome you to a future event of um, Global Plant Kitchens. So thank you very much and goodbye.